inspirational music. It feels like being on a daytime ITV show. No? This morning. Hi, Brett. Um, I, uh, we were, we're here to discuss... I, there was a nice introduction already, so I'm not going to reintroduce everybody to save some time. Um, we're here to talk about the role of capital and financial tools in driving innovation and socialising value. And as it happens, because we've been provided this amazing platform, and as a result, we've been given dominion over, over this platform. So we're now going to change the rules, and we're going to change the title. We're actually going to... We've, con, we've reached a new consensus, and we're going to discuss something completely different. We're going to discuss whether or not the collaborative model and collaborative you know, companies in general, do they inherently maybe conflict with the financial market that they're trying to uh, engage in. So on that point, I think let's start with Jeremiah's view. Oh, yes, and I think I made my point earlier, but it's backed by data. Most of the sharing economy companies, collaborative economy companies that we all know and love are owned by the one percenters, those that we wanted to get away from in the first place in the downfall, and that poses a conundrum. And just, I live, I live in Silicon Valley, around where a lot of the, the, the nice, very wealthy venture capitalists live, who have very nice cars, by the way. Teslas. That, at a minimum. At a, that's like the, the daily driving car. Then there's the Ferraris and uh, what, Bugattis and whatever. And VCs need a return of their money, typically within five to 10 years. Most of these startups got their money last year or two years ago. And so that means in just about three years from now, they need their money back. And guess where they're going to get it from? From the collaborative uh, companies. From the people, yeah. From everybody in this room, one way or another. Or it's going to go IPO, or it's going to be an acquisition, or they're going to take the money through commerce. Uh, through the, so they need their money back. So how, how does, um, the, you know, you look very specifically at uh, the val you know, how the cap collaborative economy is, uh, is shaping up in the capital markets. You, you, I mean, the values we're talking about are quite big already. That's oh, pr huge. before IPO. So what, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Oh, it's massive. So typically, tech companies are valued at five times the revenue per the year, up to ten times. So if a company's making 10 million a year, they could be valued up to 50 or 100. Did I do the math right? I think so. Now, some of these companies are valued way more. And one journalist speculated, and I can't back up the numbers because I don't know the financials, that, but Uber is, is, is um, uh, valued at 120 times its valuation. And obviously, a lack of earnings is the sort of thing that um, makes people in financial markets a little bit nervous, especially in the non-tech world. So how do you reconcile that sort of forward val valuation? Is it because we're implying a monopoly status on these companies? Oh, I, I, I'm going to have to pass to that. That's a bigger question I can tackle. Maybe some of these... So, yeah, let's bring sure. in uh, the, uh, the other side. So, Brett, what's your view? Well, I was just going to ask, actually, uh, how many people in the audience intuitively sense that normal, the normal financial sector, whether you're defining that as uh, Wall Street and the city of London, or whether you're defining it that as the sort of new financial elites in Silicon Valley, um, how many of you sense that that's the right kind of structure to be looking at for when you're building a so-called collaborative economy? Uh, sh sh show of hands. Okay. Yeah, I mean, somebody, I guess... They're inherently so, 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 I guess my, my, first, my first point is that um, and these are not going to be particularly profound points necessarily, um, is that the financial sector doesn't actually necessarily have a problem with collaborative economy. It's only got a problem with collaborative economy insofar as collaborative economy doesn't extract rent and various forms of surplus from society. Um, so actually, if you look at normal corporations, are highly collaborative structures... All right, so these are, I suppose that's sort of, um, from a, I mean, a cultural perspective, the collaboration in corporations is legally coded. 
um, with very sort of rigid um, systems of internal obligations, and you know what you have to do. You can go to the 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 the, the, the sort of um, collective store of stationery. You can take it without asking. These are whole like basically internal cultures within corporations that are highly collaborative, but they are designed to be operating within a market system, and in particular to extract various forms of profit from um, people, whilst potentially creating useful services as well. I'm not denying that. Um, and the key problem, obviously, with these, these sort of new collaborative, uh, the, the general sense of the collaborative economy, is if you break down the corporate structure, it becomes harder to um, extract rent, unless you're going to the actual platforms that, such as Uber and Airbnb and so on. Um, I'll leave it at there. Let's, what, what do you think, Indy? Um, what do I think? Um, yeah, it's a sort of huge question. I, I think uh, these organizations, as we're seeing them, they're platform economies, as you rightly said. I think they're actually reliant on monopolistic status. And actually, what, the problem isn't that whether platforms are good or bad. I'm not even going to get into that. What I'm interested in is, do we have the institutional infrastructure to actually talk about platform economies. And I think most of our thinking is still coming from a slightly outdated industrial landscape of imagining a free market, when actually these things aren't free market products. They're new classes of institutions, they're new classes of currencies, new classes of collaboration, which have to be treated in a different way. Yet we're still trying to treat them in actually a kind of pseudo-corporate way. What I found interesting, even in the panel before, and the panel before that, actually, and the discussions before that, nobody talks about governance. Everyone talks about the flow of money, everyone talks about the flow of things. No one talks about governance. No one talks about, actually, integrity of governance. Who's the governance for? It's an invisible conversation. When people talk about blockchain, they all just imagine governance will be perfect. So what is, it, what is the underlying infrastructure thinking around this? Blockchain is perfect in a world of global enlightenment, where we all become conscious and globally aligned. Blockchain is perfect. So there's a huge amount of assumptions buried in to all these technologies and thinkings that we're putting into, which are far bigger than we're talking about. And I, what I find problematic is all our conversations are about the flow and organization of capital. Actually, we don't talk about governance. You know, when we talk about collaboration, setting up collaboration economies or methods of organizing or cryptocurrency, the real challenge of cryptocurrency is not the technology of organizing cryptocurrency, it's allocating value. That's the real human challenge. How much are you actually contributing? How, what is, who, is doing, how, who is doing that valuation? How do you do that at scale? And all of the ones that have been done are relatively simplistic. So when we talk about this stuff, I think the real open question is governance. And I think the real challenge we've got is most of the platform economies, I'm gonna drop the sound bite in, most of the platform economies are really taking us towards digital serfdom. And, digital you know, feudalism. Feudalism, if you like, where the 1% are being separated from the 99. Where most, and there are no worker rights or user rights. We're, we're working into a world which is fundamentally problematic. So what we're really talking about is the return of guilds, but being structured in a way that they could become the empire. So it's like the Jedi's versus the empire. It could be, we could end up in the dark ages or we, where we have like empowered guilds, where reputation and your data comes with you, where you can migrate, right? That's the point you were making to me earlier. Yeah, the, the problem is like, okay, so say you have a user reputation on Uber, right? If I work for a normal company, I have something called a reference, where there's a cultural obligation, where if I'm working for Joseph, and I sort of say, hey, could, uh, I'm, I'm moving to another company, could you write me a reference? You'll say, yes, there's a cultural norm. The idea of cultural norms on platform references haven't been invented. So we've not discovered and allowed for interoperability. If a company said, I'm not gonna write a reference, most people wouldn't work for them. Well, there's some companies that wanna do that here, like Trades here, they wanna do that. But this is the open call. For, so how do we talk about these sort of new institutional norms? We haven't invented them and thought about them at a global enough scale. And all our conversations seem to be focused on actually the operational and the asymmetries, whereas actually the real job of government and 
government and governance at a global level is to reinvent it. If someone had a, I would think that's the really interesting moment we're in. But is, is the elephant in the room the fact that a lot of these new models, especially in the crypto equity space, which we were just hearing about, um, the fact that they celebrate a lack of governance, that's actually, in many ways, they, they see themselves as free of that, that burden. So governance can be intrinsic or extrinsic. That's a design choice. It doesn't have to be regulatory governance. Governance ha doesn't have to be imposed. I just think we need to talk about it and think about it. What keeps, what keeps the morality and the integrity of a system is a choice. And we can design that in or we can design that out. Well, I mean, there's one company that I want to praise that has done this. It's Etsy. Etsy is a B corporation. Do you guys know what B Corp is? Okay. Tell us. Because well, I didn't know about these until very recently. And I'll need help from some of my panelists, but it is a classification of a company that can abide by its sense of purpose. That's another word I'd use over governance, by the way, purpose, uh, for better good, whether it's for society or the sustainability or uh, people. It's, it's kind of like an overlay over a normal, a normal company structure where you sort of commit to not being assholes, basically. Not being assholes. That, so it's not in the byline. Um, and, and so Etsy is a B Corp, and as you know, they went public just about three weeks ago. But before they went IPO, they offered their own creatives to purchase the equity, the stock, at a discounted rate. So they shared the rewards before going public, and so those creatives generated money on the IPO. So some tech startups are sharing, and I think that's a, a noble behavior that we should celebrate and recognize and encourage the other startups in the space to follow similar patterns. So, Brett, is, is getting an early um, opportunity to invest in a, in a pre-IPO company enough of a, a sweetener to forget about worker contracts and all sorts of other things we take for granted in, in the corporate world that we know today? Well, I mean, a lot of startups do this anyway, right? Like, it's, this is how normal startup structures work. It's enticing people with equity. And I think it's a... I mean, intrinsically, I have a sense of uh, equity structures are generally um, quite positive in society to me, um, mostly because you, you use equity structures to agree who gets what from a production activity. So we all collectively get together and we agree what comes back. So really, it's a, it's a distribution mechanism. And I suppose, hmm, how do you say this? Historically, with normal companies, obviously, you, your distribution mechanisms are you have these like labor contracts, which are sucking out kind of these fixed amounts to people. And then the equity shareholders are getting whatever um, losses or surpluses. And then you have the, the, the debtors on, 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 uh, sort of leveraging that up as well. Um, <coughs> And uh, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite pro the idea of bringing in your workers into an equity structure. And this is what the whole history of sort of cooperatives is about. Um, trying to get your workers within a company to actually feel like they have a stake in the, in the future of it. And of course, um, uh, getting your workers in, uh, one way of enticing sort of at least sort of high-end workers and companies is to, is to promise them equity. Um, of course, this doesn't necessarily change the political dynamics of companies. I mean, there's lots of cooperatives who have highly sort of regressive political views because the people who've, who've got into them have then become very rich and then kind of like want to protect their market position like any other company. So there's, there's yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, these are interesting structures, but by themselves, they don't necessarily solve, um, say for example, inequality, if that's your goal. But it's a step forward. It's a step forward, yeah. And in some imagined future world, you can imagine a whole sort of... Um, uh, uh, all, all company structures connected together by equity. That's a very interesting. That's a very interesting um, vision. You, you you could say it's a step forward. You could say exactly that it was a prerequisite from the investors to lock in the makers. So because that was where the key value was. I'm, it's, it's a loyalty uh, play as well. Yeah, exactly. So let's not. I mean, and the other issue is that you create a lock in around a bunch of makers. So what happens to the next generation of makers? So there's, there's a whole generational issue in there. I think the broader issue is, and I think you ri rightly raise it, user rights. You know, we have labor rights, but we don't have union rights. Most of these organizations are cre creating liquidity and value because they're bypassing historic industrial ideas of organization of labor. So they're, they're disintermediating and reorganizing that labor field. Now that's fantastic, but there's also liabilities being accrued at a state level, which are old world liabilities like health insurance and other things, which are currently not being funded. So we are organizing, we, you know, this is basically a huge surplus capital is being sucked out in valuation format because actually socially we are all carrying that risk. 
So I, I just want us to be a little smarter. There's nothing to herald there. It's a kind of straightforward asset strip. So um, I can't remember whether it was you or Indy who mentioned that the issue is that um, we shouldn't be necessarily forwarding uh, particular companies. We should be providing capital for systems. I think it was your point, right? So in that sense, w what about um, if these platforms end up being created more on project finance terms and then redistributed to the network? So you just pay back the startup capital you need to get the platform going and then ownership is distributed between the users, the providers, the platform and the partners. I don't know. I mean, that could be a solution. I think the bigger question for me, and this is where I go back on, is I think these platforms have a different class of being. They are different from private corporates. They work outside market dynamics. And we need to recognize them as a new class of global entities which have to work differently. And I think they're almost like protocols. They're almost like TCP IP. They have to be thought of as different class of entities. And I just think we're locked into a very peculiar paradigm of thinking things are corporates or pseudo nice corporates because, you know, don't be evil. Or, but, but the unfortunate thing, I'll give you an example. This is an Airbnb example. I know they're in the room. But, but it's worth just knowing, right? So if you look at the latent racism that happens on Airbnb, about people choosing apartments, right? It's huge, it's starting to, it was a big issue in America. So, which is the preferential choice that you would make on a like-minded person to actually rent your house. Now, I'm not, I can totally understand why it happens. But the issue is we spent the last 40 years trying to get to some form of equality using industrial infrastructures. Those infrastructures that we built are all being undermined. I'm not saying the Airbnb is bad, please don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is we're not innovating our institutional infrastructures and our obligations. We're silently walking into a relational economy which can create power law logics, which is not free market. Nothing about it is going to be free market. You Jeremiah, you're yeah. burning to jump in. So I think that this is actually still a free market because there's multiple startups that any of us can work with. Uh, somebody told me earlier, I was just talking to a gentleman, there's over 70 home sharing startups out there. So there's plenty of opportunity out there. Um, and so this may be not the case here, uh, but in America there's Uber and there's Lyft and there's Sidecar. So the workers have a choice. Uh, and right now, there's, if one startup fails, you see a shift and people move on to the other space. So to me, there's still free choice. I do think that the free market capitalism can help this. And this also means that eventually these startups will need to provide worker rights and benefits. And the government in many countries are looking at this. They're going to be pressured into it sooner than later. Andy, I want to ask you, 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 you can you give us some, some, uh, some sense of what you view these sort of new government structures to be? I don't is, know. I genuinely, I don't, I, I think it's all I'm saying is I think these are domains and questions that need to be thought about and really resolved. And they are going to be integral to resolution. So I'm not saying I, I have the idea of, well, actually, if we set up a union for users, I, I, there's going to be huge sort of complexities and obligations and social obligations that are going to emerge. You know, there is conversations going on about one big uh, sharing organization providing data for mortgage mortgages so that the users or can effectively apply for mortgages based on their trust reputation with a bank. There's huge sorts of interesting interplays going to happen right now, which we don't know, but the, my worry is the lock-ins and the serfdom that they drive and the kind of digital serfdom that they drive, which is effectively very, very powerful and very global. So but, but, until, I'm sorry, but until that happens, I'm, I'm going to argue this is capitalism. And so? I mean, this is monopolism, not capitalism. We've got I to be really clear about this. I don't think Michael it's a monopoly. Porter, in his in his really nice structural uh, structural locks conversation, that is not capitalism. That is not free market. You're creating structural locks. These organize. If you had free transposability of bra of data and other things, you would then be talking about free markets. We're not. We're talking about lock-ins, which are social data, brand, reputational lock-ins. So I like the idea of it being free market, but it's not. 
And I, I fully understand that it'd be really interesting if it was. I mean, we should also evaluate like what happened with social media, which I think is a parallel to this, right? Peer-to-peer -peer media. And so there, there's many social networks people will choose from. There's many social networks on the, uh, around the world uh, that people can choose from. There's definitely some clear winners, but you still have choices to use different types of apps. What do you think? No. So, <laughs> the, I mean, the choice, I mean, the reality is, if you go to a supermarket, and I'm going to go away from social media, most of the goods that you buy, virtually all the goods that you buy, are produced by six global conglomerates. That's it. Right? So we talk about choice. There, there is no choice. There are, two, there are two global, sorry, three global social networks of scale. And they have entirely powered, this is brilliant, I'm not decrying them, they're entirely powered by network effect. I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just saying let's design them to actually be useful at a global level. They are not private corporates anymore. That's all. I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're bad. I think they're brilliant. I'm, I think they're going to change the world. I just think their institutional infrastructure is wrong and we're misunderstanding their, their purpose on a global level. So you, would you like to see them treated more as a sort of commons sort of structure? Yeah, I think they, they, we're going to have to reinvent the notion of commons. We're going to have to reinvent, you know, are there a new form of kind of WHO? Are there a new form of public good that we've generated in the world, which is fantastic? The, the, I mean, we should ask the entrepreneurs who founded these companies. The thing is they have taken $12 billion of funding from the 1%. So that is not going to unwind. That is not going to unwind. They can't. That, but that, that sounds a lot like the U.S. political system. Yeah. It's like uh, almost by the time you get to the, to the position where you can enact change, you owe pe so many people so much that you're kind of, uh, uh, you know, you're you're their man. You can't do very much else. And so you're. It would be interesting from from Indy's point of view. How do you, in a way, uh, overcome that inherent uh, sort okay, of here's corruptive? Okay, here is a scenario. Twitter's not going to be able to finance its, fina finance its valuation. It's not going to be able to drive the revenues. At this moment in time, I love Twitter. I think it's great. Now, it's never, I think there's a good chance most of these global networks will not be able to create the revenue to sustain their valuations. At that stock moment, goes down. Right. It's that so simple. It's that simple. I think there's a very interesting moment where we start to realize their common good value is f fundamentally much larger than their monetizable value. That's a good And point. that's a really interesting moment for us as a civilization. Remember, we're not just capitalists. We're human beings. And we've now built a new platform for our global consciousness, which I think sure. is fantastic. Sure. And I think the founders should be heralded, but so should the founders of the U.S., you know, U.S. state, who sort of came up with the idea of building the U.S. So there's many founders in the world. We've all built commons in a way. Yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, uh, can I maybe try? I'm trying to like figure out where this conversation is going. Really, like we don't. So know. we've Let established, we've established, roughly speaking, that there are these kind of like emergent, um, what's it called, like mesh networks that sort are of getting tighter and tighter via network effects that then sort of like look a bit like corporations, but aren't quite corporations. And people that sort of think about them in their head as being corporations, even though they don't actually behave like this, and they're not actually private entities at all because um, it's a benevolent tech deity. Yeah, in which, in which case your sort of political impulse is that you then actually want to take them over, um, which I, I that's, that's my, my, my sort of prediction, sort of political terms of the future is people will start to demand political rights from these entities that sort of masquerade as being private um, free market things, which they clearly aren't. Um, I mean, maybe for some people who actually, there's some form of active choice, but for the average person, this is definitely not the case. Um, so is that we kind of there, and then we try to figure out... Um, how the financial sector now interacts with this, because the financial sector loves the notion of um, huge network monopolies, uh, uh, which, are, which are effectively based off the existing physical infrastructure of the internet that's been built else. up over, over time. Yep. Um, and as a, as a much easier way to make money than your, your old way of having to actually build railways and actually do huge amounts of capital expenditure for things. Um, is that kind of where we, we are at? And, I think so. Okay. But I mean, my, I, I mean, I like your point about CapEx. That's where I'd like to bring the conversation back to because really yeah. a lot of these platforms we've been talking about, they're very asset light. Therefore, in terms of valuing them at these huge 
sums. We're presuming that A, they're monopolies, that B, they're their lock-ins are going to be lo long, literally long-term. Um, and thirdly, we're assuming in a way that nothing will ever change. There is no disruption coming, because if there was, they wouldn't be able to in any way generate the revenues that they're being valued at. So from, from the asset light perspective, however, for me, it seems like a really easy, disruptable model because you don't have to build a Hoover Dam. You don't have to build the sort of infrastructure that is necessary. So how do you reconcile that dominant position given the fact that you can actually, anyone can create an app quite easily these days? So that's why they have to do the lock-in. And they will lock in with data because the assets can be easily transferred. One home could be on Home Exchange or Airbnb or Home, home Away or all three. So that's why they're going to provide value-added services, insurance, reputation data, eventually cleaning services, and that's how they lock that in. That, that they need to do that. Uh, and that's what they're building is lock-in infrastructure. Their assets are social lock-ins. That's what they... And they're investing huge amounts. Let's not put it aside. You know, these places, they invest huge amounts in every city, every location, building and growing those social lock-ins. So what happens to these valuations in the event that those lock-ins are... that they disappear because, say... I can move from platform to platform, taking my followers and yeah. my reputation with me. But, but that is the fundamental question. Is, no, are those lock-ins legitimate? Do those lock-ins actually drive pub public value? Or do they drive monopolistic value? Who governs the algorithms? What's the governance? What's the bias infrastructure of those algorithms? What is the power? And these are where the questions really get interesting. So, and that's a choice of us as citizens and as civilization to think about how we want to drive that. Do we think interoperability is the way to go and we draw, demand interoperability? Or do we accept that we need global platforms, in which case we have to reinvent ideas of global institutions, which are global institutions done in a different way. That's a choice. That's a kind of a decision architecture that we have to come up with. Interop is, between the platforms is very unlikely. Very unlikely. Social net, people demanded that you could take your data from Facebook to MySpace to Google Plus. That completely failed. And Twitter and LinkedIn, completely failed. That, that's not going to, it's very unlikely that will happen. And yet there are, I mean, one, if I understand, um, you know, the concept of Ethereum, uh, that's one of the things they're trying to allow for, to create a system by which you can register all that information in a, in a, in a, in a system that is owned by nobody, and therefore you can migrate that information quite easily. So you, you don't depend on Facebook. So what happens if, if Ethereum is successful? To what degree, then, is the value embedded in the information, not in the platform? I mean, if it can happen, then you see the power shift back to the people. But, but most people, think about your grandmothers and your aunts and your uncles. They're very unlikely to participate because they don't understand it. So open ID or uh, an open social in the last phase in social networks, people couldn't understand it. It was too complicated. I, I'm just going to use Facebook. I don't care. I'm just going to use Google. I don't care. It's just, it's easy. It's on my phone. So if it's easy for the regular person, they're not going to care about interop until it's too late. But do they need to? I mean, Brett, do you think, to what degree are these valuations, and especially in the collaborative economy, uh, coming as a result of the fact that we're valuing data sets? And data sets are the new collateral in that sense. What do you think, Izzy? <laughs> I'm, I'm exploring this idea. I'm quite interested. I don't know. I have no intelligent opinion on that. I mean, um, how, do you, how do you put of, a price on you, what your data like, footprint is? Well, it will be based on what an advertiser perceives that they can sell me based on that data in the real world, I'm guessing. How, so, how, like, yes, how open are you to persuasion? Well, me, I'm a terrible person to do because I buy nothing, basically. So my data is worth nothing in, in this, in this uh, schema. Um, but I mean, yeah, some people, yeah, their data is worth something based on the fact that you can then use it to manipulate their profiles, such as you can entice them to do something and spend some money at a till somewhere that you can then, uh, it appears as a cash flow into the future that you can then base a valuation on. Um, but yeah, uh, um, I don't actually have any opinions on whether these platforms are overvalued on, on a sort of like a normal financial sense. Um, well, I mean, you could look at this. How much is a five-star blah, blah, car, Uber, rider, and Airbnb guest worth? to a retailer. I think a lot. You know, those are top customers. I think that's worth a lot of money. Um, one point, maybe I was just going to steer on, on the blockchain stuff, and I don't really know what I'm going to say right now, but um, 
I guess a lot of the sort of vision around blockchain has been pitched against these type of network monopolies that people have been talking about that are privately controlled network monopolies um, in, in favor of a notion of a sort of publicly owned network monopoly of some sort. Um, I don't think the network monopoly is the right term. People don't use that term in the, in the blockchain sphere. But this idea that you, you will, you know, everyone in this room, we could all create our own one and collectively run it. And then the sort of the question that's emerging and the sort of the critiques that are coming out around blockchain technology is that, okay, so while that on the surface appears like as a, some kind of collaborative egalitarian structure, in reality, if you don't have explicit governance um, mechanisms agreed upon and built in, it just starts to replicate existing power structures in society. And this is pretty obvious to see if you ever look at, uh, when there's various, various analyses around that. And the question comes in, well, how do you maybe uh, rectify that? Do you either build it in, into the code somehow, or do you create sort of auxiliary structures on the outside of blockchain technology to try and um, combat that? Um, and there's a, there's a few sort of emergent attempts to do this. So actually, one like, quite crazy one is, a, is a Enrique Duran's uh, Faircoin project, which some of you might have seen if you're involved in like, left-wing anarchist scenes. Um, where he's trying to use sort of crypto infrastructure, but embedded in a very particular political, social, cultural sort of um, frame where they want to sort of um, not let the, the, the crypto float above everyone, um, but actually say, we're going to control it. Um, and one of the, 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 one of the strengths of actual normal corporations is, as well, while they are rigid structures to some extent that kind of get locked in, you can actually sort of change them to some extent, and you can lobby them, and you can actually demand rights from them and change stuff. Um, whereas some of these, one of the sort of problems in the emergent crypto uh, structures is that they have this like, huge ability to get locked in and just like not be able to change. And this is a real big problem for the sort of the future governance of these, of these. And like, how do you build in the ability to actually change crypto structures as society changes? That's a really good point. And Andy, you mentioned earlier, and I think it ties in with, with what Brett's saying, that in many ways we shouldn't really be demonizing financial system, like the financial market as it stands, that we need finance, but we need, and we need these current systems to some degree as well. Uh, well, um, yes. I think the kind of, the real issue for me is governance. And as Brett really points out, is that blockchain does not automatically become public good. Actually, it's not automatically suddenly public good. It's just a network of private goods. And it only becomes public good if you put a governance architecture over it, which starts to think about it. Unless we are all enlightened individuals that live on blockchain, then it becomes public good. But actually, the reality is we're all fallible human beings with ego. And actually, at that moment in time, it's not automatic. And I think there's this automatic technocratic assumption that you put the technology in place, which we all become decentralized, we suddenly become actually good human beings. It doesn't automatically happen. I think there is issue, there are mechanisms and tools about intrinsic governance in those systems, which, but I think they need to be explored. And I think these are the real questions. So whether it's platforms, global platforms or not, I think the real question for me is governance. And what does 21st century governance look like? So I want to build on your governments. And I actually think the tech startups, those that took a lot of money from the one percenters, it's in their best interest to have a good purpose and balance. Because if they don't balance the marketplace of workers, and the people who provide, I, by the way, I use three Ps. Platforms, that's like Airbnb.com. Providers are hosts or drivers. And then partakers are the, um, the guests or the riders. So those three Ps work universally in just about everything that we all do in the collaborative economy. So it's in the best interest of the platforms to balance the rights of the providers and partakers because they have to have a balancing system. So I do think they will self-govern. They have to. I think you're right. I just think the challenge is maybe the capital they've taken and the amount of capital they've taken will make that balance very difficult. I think if any of these institutions were actually, if you took the capital input away and said, hey, we're, you are here, now how do you govern? They'd come up with a completely different governance architecture. So the reality is their journey here is so old world that it means that they're structured into a new world badly. There's, there's one solution I can think of, and I'm not a finance guy, so I will need everybody's help. So, so the investors put a bunch of money into the tech startups. What if the people, the providers and partakers that are using the platform, all of us, what if we purchased the equity and paid back the investors? And then that equity now is within the, within the community. Is that a solution? Well, 
Yeah, that was the, the kind of project finance concept that I, I would have thought is, is the sort of Mariana Mazzucato idea as well in, in so much mission-orientated finance. We find a purpose, we fund it, we, you know, we the tilt the dividends paradigm. dividends go back. And the, the dividends then are reinvested in the guild structure, presumably. Uh, but again, it's, it's the return of medievalism in many ways because this is what, exactly how the old guilds operated. The feudalism, right? The... The, the king gives the, the property. So the king is the investors, right? And then the lords are the, who own the, star, the, the own the startups, and then everybody else is a serf. Oh, no, I'm, you see, that's the structure now, but what I was proposing is we go towards the guild, sort of Hanseatic League structure, where right, actually the, the professionals uh, form their own societies, they manage how much, who's allowed into the platform, so that you never oversupply the market, but also they provide you with qualifications that, that you can then take elsewhere to new markets, that means something elsewhere. And also, most importantly, they re reinvest dividends in schools, hospitals, all the sort of stuff that their community um, gets empowered from. But, but it's interesting, even in those guilds. So let's take doctors as a guild. What's interesting about doctors as a guild is actually what they have, to, they have something called a Hippocratic Oath, right? Which is that regardless of, they will preserve the value of uh, you know, preserve the patient and their long-term outcomes. Architects also have this, right? Architects have to preserve the public good regardless of whoever pays them. So there were moral constructs built into these learned societies and guilds in order to preserve the public good without trying to create new collective bounded uh, monopolies. So, but the, the, we historically have had mechanisms to deal with monopolistic structures whilst maintaining public good. And I think we're going to have to reinvent them. And I think that's where the really interesting questions start to emerge. I think we've got some questions from the audience now. Duh, okay. Uh, hi, Aral Balkan from Indy. Um, you guys mentioned how there's choice, and I know Indy, uh, you know, spoke about uh, spoke about how we don't actually have choice. But um, when you mention social networks, for example, like Facebook, Google, you can go from one to the other. What we're not really discussing is that their business models are exactly the same. They all sell you, right? They don't sell you a product. So um, at that point, how can we even talk about choice? Um, what we're not perhaps discussing, or maybe we are with blockchain, is that can we do this differently so that we're not just making larger centers in a centralized system? Because that's what Uber does, that's what Airbnb does, Facebook, Google, it's all contributing to a centralized system of control and ownership. But how can we distribute that control and ownership? Um, I, I mean, I'd love to see us not just talking about how can we make the kings and queens behave better towards us, but how can we create a world without the kings and queens? I, I, thank you. I, I, I think these are, these are wonderful thoughts, but the reality is the, the entrepreneurs took the money from the kings. That, that ship has already sailed. That's gone. They're, they're going to get their money back. They sit on the boards. They run the companies. It's, that's already gone. Uh, and so if we were to create a collective community technology like a blockchain or peer-to-peer, -peer, you're going to be competing against a $100 million funded startup. Can we do that? Very short. If you can. Uh, do it. <laughs> So, but, I, but what about the concept, though, that you just end up creating a system where it's tyranny of the mob or tyranny of consensus, tyranny rule by the committee, rule by committee? Is rule by committee any better? Uh, you know, so nobody I mean, came uh, up with an answer. answer as a I agree with you entirely answer. about this notion that 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 just this, this choice fetish and uh, and this bullshit. I mean, it's not like 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 say supermarkets and let's take the UK a classic example. Your choice between uh, um, having the banal experience of Sainsbury's versus the banal experience of Tesco, uh, um, slowly killing your soul. Uh, um, and, and this is uh, and, and this is kind of how how the internet works as well right now. I mean, there's this notion of choices. 
Uh, and actually, the interesting thing in, in free market dynamics is always that the, the, the idea of choice is actually the governance mechanism. Or, or, or it's, or it's, a, it's a kind of a political choice you have. Or, or, let's say, the political mechanism you have is making these different choices. Um, and what I like about what Indy says is it's like, no, forget about choice. Let's think about how we actually talk to each other and actually interact uh, with, uh, outside of that kind of like choice-based mentality. Um, that doesn't actually answer anything that you asked, though. But uh, it's worth pointing out that there is this like, um, embedded choice fetish in a lot of mainstream economic thinking. Uh, well, uh, we're keen to get another question, if possible. Oh, uh, yeah, I just, I, uh, right, I and then the, we'll go back. Okay. Um, I, I love the point about governance. I think that is incredibly important. Um, I also think the ship has sailed for some people. And so trying to figure out how to do that is very tough. And one thought that just came into my head was that Netflix talks about how movies in the queue are all of the documentaries that people want to believe that they want to watch, but what they actually end up watching is Will Ferrell comedies. And so people's belief into who they are going to be is always more altruistic. And that, that's why I think getting people early on and allowing them to make these decisions like B Corp at the time when they are still empowered with what their structure is going to look like is one important thought that we, we could consider. Before, before they get corrupted, basically. Correct, yeah. Like, for example, if I went to a VC, maybe I would say, hey, can we write something that says that if at some point I promise to deliver you 50x, will you give me the opportunity to buy back everything? You know, some out, some way that I can restore the governance the way that I want to. It's just a thought to get that done early. Yeah, I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, but the thing is, the, uh, these VCs are entrenched and they're on the board and they can fire the CEO. So, so um, I totally agree with your point about this starts at the beginning. Uh, and it literally starts at the beginning of how you find your founders how you relate to your founders, how you build your community, how you organize your work. It's a cultural behavior rather than even governance. Before governance kicks in, it's a cultural relationship. And I think from there you can grow into these wider conversations. Now, I, I suppose my, my view is that I think some of this stuff is possible. I think we're gonna see some of this stuff occur. Now, Errol's point of view on this, I think to drive interoperability, we did this, right? We built TCP IP. We have had, so we have had moments. Yeah. We have built global standards. You know, these things aren't, so, you know, jokes. We built stuff like the NHS in the UK, which actually HTML. created... HTML. Huh? Sorry? HTML. Yeah, we've done huge things. So let's not be overawed by some two-bit code from four, four big global giants, which have asset light, as you say. So, but the question is, do we have the politics and do we understand it? And I think the issue is we don't have right political critiques of this. The political critiques of this narrative are thin. They're usually based on poor understanding and actually inaccurate understanding of monopolies and monopolistic power. So when the Euro turn around, European Union turn around and say, quite rightly, we want to take out Google as a monopoly, how many people turned around and said, yes, brilliant? Do you remember Frederick uh, from Blah Blah Car, the CEO's on stage, and people at the moderator said, would you ever be a B Corp or open it up? And he said, nobody's asked me that outside of like, a forum like this. That's it's, his exact words. Itzy, we take the last one. Uh, no, I, I, I have one a question. Here. Okay. I have one here. Uh, I think it's the last one, but... Uh, okay. Well. Yeah, can we do that one and that one really, really quickly? And we'll, we'll, yes. we'll make it collective. Yes, I wanted to ask about mm, taxation. You talked about a governance and it, we, we don't have, when we have monopolies that are placed in the rich world and they extract tons of value, where, why don't we have a taxation commons? If all that value goes to the 1%, it goes to the rich world, corporations that are based in the, uh, in the US, and it's very little taxation that goes to the places where it's actually generated. So there should be a new form of governance to distribute that value through taxation so that the social benefits are still covered and we don't end up having cuts in public expenditure. I think some of the, the cities are getting their taxes, right? It doesn't Amsterdam, Amsterdam or cities here get hotel tax that stays here from the commerce? I'm pretty sure. Can I, 
Can yeah, I in just Paris, yes. So I think uh, there's local taxation. Okay, quick one here, very quick. Adam? And yeah, quicker the better. Sorry to be mean and tyrannical. Yeah, I was preparing like a long question, but never mind. Now I'm going to be monopolistic, <laughs> quick. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, it all boils down to this. I mean, I really like the thing you said about how Facebook and social media are these sort of wonderful tools that have somehow been brought up by capitalism to be able to put to just useless and banal use, right? Target to, um, cat food advertisements and stuff like that. The problem is that, I think you said that, which makes my question a bit useless. The problem is that we don't really have an alternative, right? I mean, isn't that the basic problem? We don't really have a different idea about how to govern and utilize these resources. And so that's a really good uh, point to finish on, I think, because it ties in what I would like to ask, which is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And as a historian, I can't help thinking that we just cyclically go through these patterns all the time. We move from monopoly to oligarchy to democracy, like, and they all get corrupted. And corruption ha is an intrinsic part of the system that we can't get rid of. And many, many of these technocratic forces assume perfection. And perfection is actually probably an idealistic and and not extremely um, benef beneficial I idea to apply to these systems? I, I could look at it the other way, just to balance it, which is to say, actually what happens is technologies allow for new monopolies to emerge, and actually we, we slowly become enlightened to those monopolies, and we slowly build actually new governance architectures to deal with those monopolies, and the cycle moves. So actually, we're, we're, now the question is, can we transcend this cycle? Can we actually move into a new form of governance, which isn't about a global government, right? Which is about some form of decentralized, actually intrinsic governance at the level of all of us as actors. And that's a more fundamental question, which, which is heralded by people, organizations like blockchain. The invisible question in there is, can we build decentralized intrinsic governance models rather than actually global systems and platforms, centralized governance models? And that's, that's where it really gets interesting. So I agree with you, but I'm on the, positive, on the positive side. I think now is the moment to reimagine governance to deal with actually this monopolistic kind of disjunction that we've led ourselves in. It's not a bad thing, just the next move. Brett, any concluding thoughts about transitioning to a, to a system where the computers rule us instead of everybody else? <laughs> I, I believe it's called Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing particularly profound. I mean, what am I going to say? I guess... Um, the one, the one key difference here is that, is that this technology that's been created via large capital inputs is actually authentically creating the ability for some potential form of uh, mass collaboration. I agree with this point. Um, I still think there's sometimes a little bit of a disconnect in this conversation. Um, the kind of like sort of semi-utopian imagination uh, people involved, that are, live in cities and involved in innovation scenes have. Um, there's still de facto a hard, like, resource-based, um, energy-based, fossil fuels um, a basis to the economy, which doesn't really get talked about, and this is taken for granted. Um, and until you actually think about that, you don't really actually, these are somewhat abstract conversations. Um, so, I mean, that's not necessarily like a critique, it's just something we should bear in mind uh, 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 while we're talking about these. Um, but I am uh, uh, intrinsically optimistic about the potential for new forms of financing structures to emerge in these, these kind of um, um, networks. So, I'll leave it at that and we can talk and about beers. Quick closing thought. Yeah, so unfortunately for those that were concerned, like I believe this is venture capitalist, this is capitalism for at least the next five years. But I think the world is in a better place. People are, communities are more resilient using these platforms. People are getting jobs and they don't have to work at big nine to five corporations. So I think we're headed the right way. I think we should have an optimistic view. It's not perfect, but we are progressing. Thank you very much, that was very Great enlightening. Great guys, thanks for being here.